We're ready to go, Hayden. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you've all had time to, uh, those of you who are here in Longreach, to have a bit of a mingle and grab a bite to eat. Or, and if you're at home, I hope uh, last night's leftovers were just even more delicious, probably. Um, it, we're going to start in stream one first this afternoon. And this gentleman sitting beside me is our guest speaker. He's a proud Mythica man. His name is Scott Gorringe. Josh. Josh. <laughs> Josh. <laughs> He's from family. You know, lots of <laughs> members of his family, especially from the small Western uh, Queensland community. Josh. Thanks for coming in. It's great to have you here. That's fine. Um, Josh's people come from the heart of the Channel Country in southwest Queensland. In 2015, Mythica people were granted termination over 33,000 square kilometres of traditional lands, as well as a custodianship to a further 22,000 um, square kilometres of land to the east. The Mythica country encompasses the three major river systems that uh, feed Lake Eyre, and of course, we know them well in this region, the Cooper Creek, the Diamond River, Diamantina River, Eyre Creek, or Georgina River. Um, over to Josh now. He's going to be talking uh, for the rest of his session about reconnecting with country through traditional knowledge and science. So, yes, that's great. Josh, Thank you. take it away. Um, as introduced, I'm Josh Gorringe. I'm a Mythica person, also I'm the general manager of Mythica Aboriginal Corporation. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge all the traditional owners of this of the land um, and their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge Mythica people and elders past, present and emerging. Today, I will be talking about um, some exciting work that Mythica, um, UQ, Sydney Uni and Griffith and just recently Armadale Unis have been doing over the past six years on Mythica Country. This is Mythica Country. It consists of 33,000 square kilometres of determined country and as previously stated, we've also got custodianship of a further 22,000 uh, square kilometres to the east of the, our determined area back towards the uh, Windora. Um, the country consists of mainly rolling gibber plains, um, sand hill country and a lot of flood out channels. The channel country is located in the Lake Air Basin and Mythica country is in the heart of the Channel country. Located on the eastern margins of the Simpson Desert, Mythica country comprises of the three main rivers as stated before, the Diamantina, Georgina and Cooper's Creek. When it does rain in our region, it um, all the desert channels flood out into a large area, which then creates lush green waterways and um, lots of food for the animals. Here you can see some of the sites on Mythica Country. The screenshot covers just a part. We have documented over 350 new sites in the past six years of termination in October 2015. The most numerous and extensive sites we have recorded are sandstone quarries, silk creek quarries, and large occupation sites. We have also entered into agreement with UQ Griffith and Sydney unis for further un understanding and ageing of some of these virtually untouched sites. With the help of the universities, we will be able to build, understand and create huge opportunities for Mythica to teach the wider community about Aboriginal ways of life hundreds, if not tens of thousands of years ago. A key part of um, the research Universities as we developed the uh, Mythica research, which um, we call Nalaganthi Wanthi, we search together. Um, this document outlines our research goals and objectives, 
and defines how Mythica and the research partners work together to form a true partnership in every sense of the word. Mythica developed this framework in con consultation with all the Mythica people. If anyone would like to read the document, it's on our website, mythica.org.au. The funding that helped support, funding in support of the Mythica research framework is the ARC linkage. We've got um, two caring for country, uh, two caring for country grants and a two land and sea grants. From these, from these directly fund funded opportunities, we've been able to uh, map, a, map a lot of cultural heritage sites, burial sites. We can further protect them through fencing off of the area. We also done um, some work with um, the Duncan Kemp family, um, which in 2019, we conducted a meeting with them. She, Alice Duncan Kemp lived on Murabri Station. Alice grew up on Mythica country in the early 1900s and had a unique opportunity to learn from my ancestors. Alice learned from Mythica people. She recorded her experiences and wrote five books on the life and adventures with Mythica people. From these books, we have relocated a number of sites that we thought were special places of interest. In June 2019, we had the opportunity to meet with Dawn and Professor Tom Griffith, Griffith and a number of other researchers. Sadly, last year, Dawn passed away. Um, also, one of the other sites that we have out on country that we've been doing extensive research on is a place called Black Hill. The traditional name is Nunandari, which means the teacher. The archaeological, archaeological of, the, of Black Hill consists of extensive silt crete outcrops along the top of the hill line, which is sporadically exploited and small sandstone quarries next to which intensive quarrying and flaking areas with large silt creep blades. The is to be 1769 years old, plus or minus 64 years, which makes the site around the year 188 to 316 mark. This is exciting. This this has been an exciting find as previous to the site, earliest stone blade sharpened edged tools were dated around 800 years. So obviously that means from this site, we have worked out that stone blades have been made for a lot longer. With a, approximately about another thousand years on top of the previously discovered um, sites. One of the important ways we have been documenting important places in the landscape is through aerial scanning, photographs using drones, through our looking after country grants. We have employed a team Rubicon to professionally do aerial images that provide us with a record of the site that can be used for an, anal, analyzing, interpreting, and for education. The aerial imagery has been really valuable at sites like sandstone quarries, on, at the site of the sandstone quarries, just east of Murbury. It is possibly, it is the largest known sandstone quarry in Australia and if not the world, it consists of 25,000 individual quarry pits and artefact areas over nine square kilometres. This is truly an unbelievable site to look at. Mythica people use these sandstone quarries to get materials for grinding stones and for their own use, as well as for trade. The trade route was from the Gulf of Carpentaria all the way down to the Northern Flinders Ranges in South Australia. Using technology has allowed us to make 
incredible, incredible detailed records of sites that cover very large areas. For example, the patterning of the stone quarry complexes, georectified drone scans allow us to more quickly mark records that can be used with GIS to study and show archaeologists in the future. We have been doing an in-depth study on the quarries, including mapping, artefact recording and dating program. In this slide, the preparations are being made to take OSL samples in the later evening. And the second slide shows the complete sample sequence after we've got the ages. Um, on this particular site, we have taken only five samples out of a possible 25,000 pits, which isn't a big sample. The early dates of these samples are around 1,000 plus years ago. Another site, which is much smaller in area, approximately 150 kilometres away, the dates have come back from those grinding stone pits of about 2,500 years or so. With more samples in the future, we will better understand the ages of this big quarry. There is just one, this is just one of many stone arrangements in our country. This site has only just been rediscovered last year. It was recorded in 1961 by the Bureau of Mineral Resources. It's in the early stages of research. Um, so hopefully in the next sort of 12 to 18 months, we'll have some dates of how old it would be. Um, this is just another stone arrangement site that we've, we've discovered and obviously we'll do more research on it as well. In this slide, it shows one of two gunyas, old houses in Mythica country. And through the research, we have discovered that these two wooden buildings could be the oldest standing buildings in Australia, dating back between 1650 and 1670. So as you can see, through research, and the knowledge of Mythica people, the forming of great partnerships, we can retell and better educate the wider public on Indigenous history, life, which in turn, we can better understand and protect the fragile and ancient landscape, which is the Lake Air Basin for everyone to enjoy. Mythica's aspirations after the research is to get into better land management practices and work closely with the pastoralists to better protect the landscape of um, what we've got out there. Obviously, the waterways is the number one priority for us out there. Without water, it's our lifeblood. Um, yeah, so we've recently got just um, being granted four land and sea ranges from um, the land and sea ranges program and that will help us then go out on country more often and document these sites and help better protect the water holes, um, get into re reseeding of country. Um, obviously after long periods of drought that we've experienced out there, a lot of the country's not bouncing back as good as it should. Um, large numbers of cattle out there, so um, we're, we're trying to start to get a project together where we can reseed vast areas and lock them up so they can become a seed base for the rest of the parts of the Channel Country. Thank you. So there's the first question that's come through. Buddy.
Um, how can it be shared beyond um, scientific publications? Currently, we're in the process of getting the scientists to do a lot of plain language reports up for us, and as they come through from the scientists, we'll upload them onto our websites and um, have a link in there to go to all the scientific research we've done. Um, yeah, so that's basically, and, and we do uh, monthly newsletters that we um, send out to our members and in turn through word and mouth, we're sort of sharing our stories through word and mouth predominantly at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Josh, for that presentation. Uh, we're now going to, we'll be taking questions uh, for Josh again uh, later in the panel session, which will be after our next speaker, who I'd like to introduce now. Can we welcome to the stage Paul Thiesten? He is going to be talking about Aboriginal cultural site protection. A, a, a three-way collaboration is the title of his presentation. So enjoy and we'll see you back here for the panel afterwards. I'm going to be presenting on Aboriginal cultural site protection, a three-way collaboration. My name's Paul Theakston and I work for the Western Local Land Services in Western New South Wales. The co-author of this presentation is Blackie Gordon. Now, I voted that Blackie Gordon do this presentation, but he voted that I do the presentation. So I drew the short straw, so that's why I'm doing it. But Blackie didn't get out of it entirely. He's pre-recorded a message and we'll hear from him in a second. So this three-way collaboration is between Rangeland Rehabilitation Program run by the Western Local Land Services, Aboriginal Community and Land Managers. So this is Blackie Gordon and we're going to hear from him now. Uh, my name is Bert, Gordon better known to family, friends and work colleagues as Blackie. I've worked in natural resource management for 17 years with the Western Region. Firstly, before I continue, I'd like to pay my respect to all traditional custodians and to elders past, present and future. From the land on which I speak, the Gamilaroi or Gumaroi people, and also the lands that I travel through and work. <clears throat> the importance of Aboriginal traditional land management, knowledge and practices are becoming more widely used to help sustain this country of ours. Aboriginal culture and heritage are also important to the history of Australia. Prior to any project commencing that could arm or damage an Aboriginal site, a site survey will be carried out to locate and be recorded on the Government AIMS database. During my time arranging this survey with local community elders or knowledge elders, there seemed to be a really process between the Aboriginal communities and land managers. By having local people knowing that their traditional sites, such as scar trees, burials, art sites, or just knowing what's out there, is being protected and recorded, proves the myth that Aboriginal people will try and claim this land because of these sites is not true. I've witnessed more community people give land managers a call and ask if it's okay to take their young ones to country to show and teach them about the sites that they have helped record. Recording and protection of First Nations people's heritage is important to the history of this country and its people. Thanks for listening. So that was Blackie Gordon. So I'm going to elaborate on what Blackie has just said. So I've got to explain what the Rangeland Rehabilitation Program is all about. So it's a program that the LLS runs and it's all about fixing erosion or preventing further erosion. So this photo gives an example. So we can spread water away from erosion gullies. So you can see what's happening in this photo. Water used to go down that erosion gully, but we've constructed a series of banks and it takes the water out onto the floodplain. Or instead of spreading the water, we can also pond the water. 
So if the area is a scald or a dehydrated wetland or a degraded Gilgai, we can construct banks pond water. So to do this requires heavy machinery to construct the banks. So obviously it has a potential to destroy or damage Aboriginal sites. So this is where Blackie Gordon steps in. So a number of years ago, um, he initiated a collaboration between the local Aboriginal communities, the Rangeland Rehabilitation Program and land managers. So this is a photo of um, Blackie and myself at one of these particular projects, um, proving that we work. Oh, well, we lean on shovels anyway. Um, so a process was set up and this process starts before any works are designed or laid out and before construction. So I'll go through this process now. So the first step is um, where Blackie or one of our other Aboriginal community um, staff members, they, they engage the local um, community and they go out to the project area and conduct an assessment. So they find the sites, they flag them, and then they record them and mark them. So everyone involved in the project knows where the sites are. So after this um, step, we um, go out and design and lay out the project accordingly. So that photo there shows my ute with a tine marker at the back and it, it drags a tine in the ground, leaving a mark. And that's where the bulldozer driver or the grader driver um, construct the bank, exactly where that mark is. So in this photo, you can see the, the mark is going around and half site. Um, the half side there it represents the bottom of a, of a fire pit. So once it's all marked out, that's when the machines come on site and the earthworks are constructed accordingly. So it's very important that the uh, machinery operators know what each of those um, flags mean and what each of those marks are. So everyone knows what we're trying to achieve. And so by working together, um, we're trying to achieve the same goals. And so there are four goals that we are trying to achieve with this um, three-way collaboration. Um, and I'll go through these goals. Um, the first goal is to prevent the destruction and, of Aboriginal sites and to protect them from further destruction. So this photo here shows a hearth site that used to be buried, but erosion has exposed it so that dashed black line represents what used to be the soil surface and it's now eroded away, exposing a site. So we wanna pre prevent that hearth site from destruction. So when we construct our earthworks, we, we go around them, but also um, the earthworks are designed to help prevent the destruction. Um, we also wanna protect from further destruction. So the Hearth site on the left hand side, it, it's been exposed relatively recently and you can see it's just starting to deteriorate. Um, the photo on the right hand, um, on the right hand side shows a, what once used to be a hearth site, it's just scattered stones and baked clay now. So we want to avoid that situation. So we want the hearth site on the left hand side not to become like that on the right hand side. So we want to protect from further destruction. So the question is, does it work? Um, are Aboriginal sites protected? So in this photo, you can see the dashed lines represent a water ponding bank and the um, foreground is where the water ponds and where the vegetation grows. And in that area, there are a number of hearth sites that have been um, protected. So they're protected because the topsoil doesn't erode away anymore. Um, the vegetation grows around it and, and keeps it all into place. So if you zoom up, you can see a hearth site there and, and it's buried and it will remain buried because of those water ponding banks. So yes, um, it does work. So the second goal is to facilitate reconnections to the country. So these photos 
show sites and places that the local Aboriginal community members have been able to access. Now, this is a big deal. Um, ordinarily, um, local community members haven't been able to access private land for decades or even over 100 years. So it's a big deal that they can now get onto the country and look around and just reconnect with what's there. Um, I've had a community member tell me that some of the sites and places he's visited as a result of this um, project. Um, they're some of the best places he's seen. Um, and he's really um, excited that he's been a part of being able to protect um, these sites for future generations. And, and he goes back to his local community and he tells the younger generation about what's out there. Um, it's not just in national parks, like these places and sites, they're just scattered across the entire landscape. And that brings me to the third goal, and that is to pass knowledge to the younger generation. So these community members, they come out um, and they're involved in assessing the project area and flagging all the sites and places, and they're able to tell the younger generation about them all. So these um, photos are sites and places that the local Aboriginal community members have been a part of, been a part of being able to protect and pass that knowledge on to the younger generation. So that's a really good um, goal, which is being achieved. The fourth goal is to establish how Aboriginal people used the land in the past. So this photo, is a photo of, of water ponds um, constructed a number of years ago. And you can see vegetation is established in them, but before that, um, it was all a scalded floodplain. And as far as you I can see, it is a floodplain. Um, but when you look closely inside that water pond, you can see an elevated area. And uh, when you just look around that elevated area, you can see numerous stone tools, um, different size grinding, um, stones and, and there's hearth places and it really shows that there was a really um, high concentration of Aboriginal people using that one little area there in amongst this vast floodplain. So it, it, it sort of helps us to start drawing a picture of how Aboriginal people use the land and by um, constructing water ponds around it or, or preventing further erosion, it, it preserves that story. And so it's, um, it's a really good outcome. So this three-way collaboration is actually achieving a lot of goals. Um, it's achieving good outcomes for the local Aboriginal community, um, but also for the land managers. Um, the Rangeland Rehabilitation Program, it achieves really good environmental um, outcomes and it achieves really good agricultural productivity outcomes for land managers. But now when we're um, working with the local Aboriginal community, um, it's helping land managers appreciate another aspect of the land that they manage. And it's a two-way um, learning process and, and it's really good to be involved in that and, and see some really good outcomes coming out of it. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, um, please contact myself or Blackie Gordon. Thank you. Thanks very much for that presentation, Paul. Um, now we're going to welcome Paul back to the stage, but this time he's going to be joined by Josh Gorringe. And uh, also to facilitate this panel session, uh, I'd like to welcome back Paul McDonald, who spoke earlier uh, this morning. Um, so I will hand over for the panel. Remember, if you'd like to put in a question, which the chaps will be hoping that you do, this is your opportunity, go to the live Q&A um, option down the bottom of the screen, type in your questions and they'll pop up and that uh, will basically um, determine the conversation. Take it away, Paul and company. To Josh, um, we've got a few questions coming through, so please keep them coming. Um, I was particularly interested to hear uh, Josh's talk because essentially he's given you an example of how nations um, look at country and, and 
how they are blending Western science and Aboriginal science to create uh, a uniqueness that lies in our now our combined culture if we're if we're ready to think that way um, and I guess watching how uh, Paul and his crew in the LLS have been working together with Aboriginal nations to try and bring together some of those um, grazing and standard management practices for rest restoration of landscapes to actually protect that culture and you know it, it, it's great to see all that stuff coming together so um, one of the questions that's here is for probably um, you, I think, Josh, and that's, yeah. is there a good understanding of traditional trade routes um, and, and what was traded and how that trading might have occurred? Um, through the research, obviously, um, we're learning more and more about what was traded. Obviously, from the research that we've conducted with, with the universities, We've sort of, uh, it's basically showing that due to the large scale of the sandstone quarries, the silk creek quarries for the bladed tools and that, it's basically saying that we're probably one of the big producers of grindstones in that trade route. Um, a lot of our stone axe heads that we've got down our country come from around the jar there somewhere. There's a place up there where they are produced. Um, We've got samples of them, of them axes that have been analysed, and they're the same um, makeup DNA of the other rocks up around the Dijar area. So um, we're getting a better and better understanding of the trade route. Um, hopefully, in the future, we can get some of our neighbours on board to help do some research as well, and that that'll better link up that. Um, scenario of a trade route, I suppose. All right, thanks, Joss. Um, with, um, for you, Paul, I think is, um, many landholders have been reluctant to enter into formal access arrangements, but have informal arrangements with their local mob. It is important to formalize, or is it important to formalize these agreements? Or, or what is your experience around how you're working with those uh, landholders and those nations. Yeah, so with each of these projects, um, the landholders enter into a contract um, and part of that contract is to um, have this access for the local communities. Um, it's not a, I don't think it's a formal access agreement. It's just part of the contract um, requirements um, and it's not, uh, or we've never had any issue with landholders with that um, part of the contract. And um, they've always been really happy to sort of engage. Um, so yeah, it's not, I don't think it's a formalized um, access agreement in what um, you might be thinking. Um, but yeah, it's definitely hasn't caused any issues. Um, yeah, hope that answers the question. Thanks, Paul. Um, one for you, Josh, again. Um, how is public access managed on, on your country? Um, the, the comment is that in the Kimberley that um, a lot of the public tend to do more damage than the landholders themselves. A lot of the sites we've got out there are far enough, far enough off the main road. Um, a lot of the tourists out in that country sort of travel between Windora and Birdsville, Birdsville, Baduri, and then back to Windora kind of thing. Most of them are just happy to get to the other end. Um, we haven't had a lot that's been disturbed. Over the years, in previous years, with road upgrades and stuff, we have noticed the councils have destroyed some of the sites. Um, seismic lines, they're probably the sort of the two major ones, is the, the, the councils um, pre obviously us getting determination um, this has occurred. Um, they're probably the two biggest sort of risks that we've had is seismic lines through the middle of sites and more or less, um, yeah, the councils with their new roads and the road upgrades. There's probably one site that pops into mind where we had a stone arrangement where there's a gravel pit right on the edge of the road. People have turned the stone arrangement into their names and totally destroyed it. 
Um, it's a hard thing to manage. You put a sign up. Um, people want to pull up then and take stuff from the site. So it's been a tricky one that we're still sort of negotiating around, obviously, with the board, with the Mythica board and um, the other members to see how we best protect sort of the sites that are along the edge of the road. It's sort of a hard one to sort of, you, you point it out to people, they're more inclined to stop, look at it, just take something home with them as a souvenir, I suppose. I guess the other, other end to that question is, um, how does the nation see opportunities for tourism then? Um, probably for us, we, we were looking more at um, doing virtual tours, um, not so much online per se, but we, we're, we're aspiring to get a cultural centre or a keeping place, whichever terminology you want to use. Um, and that would have, whether you do a VR goggles or walk into a virtual room and you, it's like as if you're at the site. Um, I think that's the best way to protect the country purely because we've got, they're all partial leases out on our country. So to pr also protect the partialists from obviously soil erosion and vehicle access and all that, I think the best way for us tourism wise is virtually. Um, and probably another big thing with that tourism side of thing, the more better educate, the better the education we can give the wider public, the more knowledge they will have and probably hopefully have more respect for the country that they're driving through, whether it's Mythica country or anyone else's country. Um, and in that centre, we'd like to sort of set up something, a research arm to it, where, to, where tourists and um, locals alike can go in there and watch the scientists work on artefacts instead of taking all the artefacts away. The artefacts stay on country, they can do all the research there. We can then return the artefacts to where they belong or put them in a safekeeping place in, inside the facility. And that saves a lot of artefacts and stuff that's happened in the past. They've gone missing when they get the unis, they've been misplaced or mislabeled and stuff goes missing. So that's sort of the big opportunity we, we see to help best protect the country and to educate the public is have an interpretive centre where we yeah, do stuff a lot more virtually. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Um, one for Paul, um, and you've sort of partially answered it, but is there a program that facilitates opportunities for pastoralists to work with traditional owners to recognise and protect those culturally significant sites um, in your part of the country? I can talk a little bit about Queensland. Um, I, I'm not really aware of it. I, I'm pretty much um, focusing on that erosion side of things. and. Blackie Gordon would have been able to sort of talk more about that. So I can't really answer that sensibly, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. all right. Well, certainly in Queensland, there's the Cultural Heritage Act and there is a duty of care that goes under that act. And essentially most of the work that happens on country out in the pastoralist areas um, <coughs> is, is around that duty of care. It isn't well known and there is some work that uh, our company started with um, a couple of the nations we work with to try and help that understanding. But I, I don't believe there's a general program other than the websites that um, the various state government jurisdictions have that uh, contain those sort of documents. Probably to add to that too, we've conducted some cultural heritage training, not only for our members to better understand the artefacts and stuff as well, but to also bring the councils in and the pastoralists in to make them better appreciate the cultural significance and for them to identify sites too, which then in turn helps protect the sites better. All right. Um, another one for you, Paul, and that's with those sites that you're beginning to protect by just good, good land management and stopping the erosion processes, um, is, is there a... Um, a community understanding of that work and uh, people wanting to come and have a look at it and uh, do they come back regularly if they do? Um, the local Aboriginal community, um, there are a few properties where they do come back regularly. 
Um, generally, no, because uh, it's more of an informal um, agreement. Um, but what, what we're finding, um, it sort of breaks the water between the land managers and the local Aboriginal community. So it's sort of like an introductory process in some cases. So then um, they do, they are able to go back on there. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned before, it's not a, a formal access agreement. It's just um, case by case basis. But yeah, in some cases, definitely they've been able to go back um, with the communities, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, there's a there's a sort of a follow up question, and I think we're going to have to shoot David Phelps. He asked too many questions. Um, how do we prevent sites from being destroyed through ignorance of of their importance? I guess that that has a an element of what you've been talking about, Paul. But I guess also, Josh, you might want to comment as well. I probably think um, with the cultural heritage training that we, we've sort of provided in the past to pastoralists um, and the councils, I don't think people can really use the excuse that they're ignorant of the problem. That's the whole point of cultural heritage training is to make not only councils, the pastoralists, and obviously once we get the um, interpretive centre up and running, the wider public. Um, if we can get all them, them three stages done, you can't really say that, you, oh, I didn't know. Um, I think that's, it all comes back to better education of everyone, really, yeah. That, that um, partially answers this next question, but um, probably for you, Paul, as well. Does the engagement that you guys are doing extend into other cultural management practices, or is it, it's a, as you said before, focus more on those artefacts? Yeah, well, my, my program, yeah, focuses um, on those sites and places. Um, there are programs, uh, like broader programs within the local land services that look at um, management practices. But yeah, I, I'm um, afraid to say Blackie Gordon knows the details of those ones. Um, but yeah, there are other programs, definitely. All right. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Probably for us. Yep. Um, as of 2021, 20, the start of this year, we started up our land management team, which um, we we're fortunate enough to get some contracts with DCQ for to help them in the fight against prickly acacia, the rubber vine and stuff, um, which then we've, through that, we've currently got four young fellas employed, plus Max, my dad, who runs the team, and we're putting his knowledge and my knowledge and other knowledge of other people within Mythica into practice for that land management side of things. Um, we, we do a bit of soil erosion, obviously, like I said, we're talking about doing a bit of pasture rehabilitation, um, eradication of, um, of feral animals, plus um, the weeds. Um, I think it's a good thing we've been engaging with a lot of youth at risk um, and getting them out of the cities and stuff pre them going to jail and bringing them back out on the country and giving them a bit of sense of home um, and they begin to value their lives. And that's all directly related from the scientific research we've done to help them teach them our culture, which in turn, hopefully, when they go home, they'll be excited and they want to learn more about their culture. So, yeah. Thanks, Josh. Um, here's here's a, a probably a side question, but do you have records of the songlines across your region and your walking trails? We've got records of um, some of the songlines, yes. Um, obviously, like we were talking about in previous presentations, um, most of the walking trails would have been along old stock routes. Um, song lines seem to follow a lot of the river systems and stuff like that and other sites significance obviously like the um, Black Hill that was in my presentation um, it was it was called the teacher for a reason so I think it was a wide part of that teaching process was a part in the song lines yeah excellent um, 
someone has asked the question I was going to ask you, so that's good. <laughs> How is the broader Mythica community involved in works on country? And that's Leanne asking. Um, we have currently, at the moment, we we have um, lots of um, my uncle George out there. He he does a lot of cultural heritage stuff with me and myself, the chair of the board, Trudy. She does a lot of work out on country doing cultural heritage clearances. Also, we work with the scientists closely. Um, when a research trip comes up, we send an email out to all the members, um, the ones that can come, obviously. A lot of us do work, so it's, it's um, one of them things where if you can fit the time in to come out, good. Um, we're currently doing a lot of youth camp stuff. We've done a youth camp last year and we just finished up one last week to better educate our young people of what, what their country means to them, I suppose. And it's also, we're spread all over Queensland. Um, there's, we've got family up um, Northern Territory and down the... New South Wales and South Australia, Palm Island. Um, so it's good to get the younger generation to come back and reconnect too, I suppose, and learn about the sites as well as work with the scientists to understand some of that exciting scientist sort of research that we're getting out of the country. Yeah. Um, here's another question again for you, Josh. You're a bit popular, <laughs> mate. <laughs> um, well, we've got you on the seat for more than a year. And it, and it it sort of harks to some of um, the controversy around Bruce Pascoe's stuff um, and some of the, the work done by um, three academics in mm -hmm. in Victoria. Is there evidence of how plants were used, managed and potentially farmed around the country? I'll start off with saying I don't disagree with some of the stuff Bruce Pascoe said. I think he's put a challenge out there to science to, in my opinion, to prove him wrong. And if they can't prove him wrong, he must be right. So um, there's there's plants that are out on country, plum tree, native plum trees and stuff, that there is no reason why they should be grown where they are. And they're in clumps of five or six here, and then you go around to another little rocky outcrop where, where it catches water all the time when you do get the rain. So I think... There could be the possibility of horticulture that way. Um, we've got fish traps out on country where obviously they've manipulated the water to trap the fish in. I know of um, there is stories of netting the the um, diamond tan channels back in, in the day to catch fish and stuff. Um, so, look, yeah, I, I, I think Indigenous people have been under... Under, I don't know what word it be, but they've made out to be dumber than we we are. We, we lived on the land for the last 60,000 years, so we obviously had to adapt, had to learn all the things to work with the land. So I think there's a lot of promise behind what he's saying about agriculture and just because it doesn't fit into what a dictionary says agriculture is doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't agricultural activities done. All right. Well, at this stage, that seems to be all the questions. Um, last call for any questions. Um, in the meantime, I guess I've, I've got one question, uh, and that's around how you relate with neighbouring nations. Um, in, in Western cultures, we all think that, you know, we can all collaborate and do stuff. But um, in Aboriginal culture, there are some conditions that have to be met, as I understand things. So. Is there any relationships that you work with neighbouring nations? Not currently. We we do we get along with all the neighbours. Don't get me wrong. Um, we we talk to our neighbours around Birdsville. Um, I've just recently done some work up with um, the Pitta Pitta mob, helping them out doing some reporting for the cultural heritage stuff. Um, I think the big thing at the moment is. Um, We've just got to all work together a lot better, I suppose, and share our knowledge of one another's country a bit more. Yeah, I think there should be a lot more of that. Um, we can't all be tight-lipped, we're neighbours, so, yeah. I, I, we've got a good relationship, but I don't know, as far as saying working together, we not a lot of us do a lot of work together at the moment. And a lot of us out there 
at early stages too. So we're sort of just getting our corporations up and running. So we're sort of sticking to ourselves, I suppose, in a way too. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Josh. Um, Paul, with the way in which you're operating, um, doing those earthworks and things does take some time. So um, when you're working with Blackie, is Blackie part of the LLS or um, is Blackie, Blackie's job then to go and find the culturally uh, or cultural authority to able to walk country in front of you? Is that, that how you guys are walking with it? Yeah, yeah. Blackie's employed by the local land services. Obviously, he's, he's local to, um, like, like he said, he's local to that sort of Brewarana area. Um, but, yeah, he, his job is to find the community members where that particular project is going to be happening. Um, so, yeah, oftentimes, yeah, he's got to obviously go around to the local community, which takes time sometimes to, to find the relevant person that he needs to be engaging with. And, and then so he, he that's he's sort of um, doing that and then then actually goes out on site with those community members himself um, and, and working with them um, like with the running them through the process of how to record sites and all that sort of thing all that sort of technical stuff yeah so we've got a number of um, people like Blackie um, yeah so in located in different parts of the western area so yeah, that's how it generally works, yeah. All right. Thanks, Paul. Well, there aren't any other questions at this stage, so I'd very much like to thank you, Paul, and you, Josh, for um, giving us a bit of an insight into your worlds and what you're doing. So thank you thank very you much for that opportunity. Thanks very much, chaps. I also wanted to mention that there is a live poll happening. Uh, to do with the session that you just were in. The question is, which of the following presents the greatest opportunity for the rangelands? Are reconnecting with country or protecting Aboriginal cultural sites? So feel free to uh, vote in that one. We've got 100% so far with just three votes, so if everyone else could also uh, vote there. That wraps up this session for Stream uh, 1 for the moment. Uh, now there is an opportunity for you once you leave here to go and uh, go and do your networking. Go and check out the posters. There are some fantastic ones there. A lot of effort and time has put into uh, creating those. There's some lightning sessions, um, which are short, sharp, great uh, informational sessions. They're all available for you now in the resource library. Be sure to go back there. Afternoon tea. Uh, it feels like we've only just come back from lunch, but it, we're going to take a break now until um, um, the session will end at three. Um, we've got time to go through, have a look at the resources, meet each other. I have got a notice for anyone who is going to the dinner tonight. You need to be at the railway station at 5.45 this afternoon to make the bus to go to the dinner tonight. If you're not at the railway station by 5.45, you will miss your lift and you'll miss out on dinner. So it's very important to make sure that you're at the railway station, which is directly across the road uh, from the centre where we are today. Thanks again to our presenters of the last session and for Paul for jumping in and facilitating at such short notice. Unfortunately, Dana Kelly was unwell. I'll leave you now and then we're back uh, for the virtual tours that are going to commence at 3.15.